Hello. So during the electoral campaign, Marine Le Pen mostly put the attention on the indirect effect that the world is having at internal level, mostly, for example, mentioning the rising cost of goods and energy consumption for French citizens. Um, she didn't really mention openly how um, her frame policy in case of election would or would not change towards the current situation. On the other hand, we know that she has quite a lot of ties with uh, Vladimir Putin Russia that were built in the past years. Um, in light of this, can we actually expect a possible change of paradigm in case of her election or it's not really likely to happen? Thank you very much in advance. Um, of course, uh, I will not want to, at this stage, go into a um, position myself uh, in view of the second round of the French presidential elections. Uh, I'm a Swedish diplomat and of, we, as European uh, citizens and uh, working with, you know, in, you know, with politics, uh, but also with the personal, I've lived in France, I follow you know, French politics very closely and uh, follow with high interest now the outcome of the elections, uh, the second round of the elections uh, and, and on Sunday. Uh, and they will be extremely important, of course, for, for, the, for the future of Europe and how we work together in, 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 in Europe. I can only hope, and that's as far as I can go as a Swedish diplomat, uh, that given what is at stake, uh, this young lady, Julia, I fully understand the content of her question. Uh, yes, we can look at our national relations, bilateral relations, economic dependencies, uh, uh, dependencies on energy import that, you know, that varies within the EU towards Russia. And of course, when you are leading a country, disregarding what party you are representing, you're, as a leader of your country, your prime interest and responsibility and concern will be towards your own citizens. That is fully understandable. But I think uh, as a European country uh, and what binds Europe together are our common values and that we share and understand that what now is going on in the Ukraine, an open military aggression by Russia towards an independent sovereign country, the Ukraine, that is totally unacceptable. And we are very pleased, Sweden, this, we are, this, I, I represent a country which is a neighbor, you know, it's, it's uh, a neighboring country uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we are, you know, we follow what's happening in our Eastern neighborhood. So we're directly affected as well about the, uh, of, of the uh, war in, in Ukraine. But I think what uh, we have seen uh, growing out of the present, uh, this, this, awful, this awful situation, is a more united Europe and a more united transatlantic cooperation with uh, US and with Canada. And in the United Nations context, 141 countries that voted clearly to, 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 uh, to um, uh, criticize and take a strong stance that this behavior is unacceptable. And this is also a principal issue at global level that we that unites the global community. And I therefore take, therefore take for granted that whoever is elected the leader of France will continue to share that position and will be able to make the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And what we see going on in, in, in the Ukraine is, is unacceptable, is wrong. And whoever becomes the president of France will undoubtedly, and that is our expectation, defend that stand. Hi, I'm Kostian. Europe is now in the midst of a severe energetic crisis where the prices are also increasing. France is ramping up its nuclear power as Germany is closing down their nuclear power plants. Does this show that there is not a unified approach between two of the most important union countries when we talk about energy policies and does that affect the EU Green Deal and the fight against climate change overall? Thank you. I think with what we see today and what the military aggression of Russia towards Ukraine and that is not new. It started already in 2014 with the annexation, illegal annexation of Crimea. It actually goes back, in our view, to 2008, uh, the war with Georgia, and and uh, today the establishment of two, uh, the part of Russia, uh, South East and Abkhazia, part of Georgia, 
uh, with Russian support. Uh, all this shows a tendency in Russia that, and today we see exactly how far the Russian ambitions have gone and what they are ready to do to achieve their objectives. So we now have uh, with a fully fledged war going on in Ukraine. With all this understanding and knowledge, uh, what we see today, I think um, Berlin probably, but you would have to ask German representatives of, you know, uh, of the, the German government, uh, and perhaps also France, fr French uh, government representatives. Uh, I think today the choices they took, and now I think in particular about Germany, which has this, uh, rightly said in the question, has created a very strong, allowed itself the strong uh, dependency to Russia on gas and oil imports. Probably that choice and the choice of Mrs. Uh, you know, Chancellor Merkel would have been different had she understood what, what we all today understand when we see uh, when we see uh, and we watch uh, what's going on in Ukraine and we see, as I said, we see how far Putin has taken uh, his ambitions. Uh, so I think the, the um, when we today look forward, we look at the Green Deal, we look at, at the, 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 the climate crisis, which of course has not gone away, but I think we just as, as countries and now we as diplomats, uh, now we first of all have to focus on what is the most important here and now, and that is to assist Ukraine with all the means possible, diplomatic means, economic means, humanitarian, and not the least, as President Zelensky has made so clear, to assist uh, Ukraine military-wise with military equipment. My country, which has a defense industry, has made this enormous step for our country. You know, it is, we have probably the strictest laws as, regard, as regards um, as regards providing military equipment, defense equipment to countries during a crisis. And we have made, we have you know, not changed our laws, but we have seen to that we in this situation were, uh, will probably have as an effect that we will have to revise these laws. But because of the emergency and the urgency of the situation, uh, we are we we jumped over our shadows and we now are one of the big uh, troop contributors, um, military equipment contributors to Ukraine because the focus is here and now. Uh, we're talking about life and death. We'll be talking about the survival of a country like Ukraine. And Ukraine's, uh, Ukraine's independence and Ukraine's future has to be secured. Um, where we can, so I would still claim that we are united in the long-term objective uh, and, and taking all the means we can when we talk about green transition and, and, and meeting the, uh, the climate goals uh, Sweden, this is one of the key priorities of the Swedish government, but it's also a key priority for all European countries. The timetable will look different because the energy mix in most countries look different. Look, look, looks different. And we see still a European Commission strongly engaged. We just had the Commissioner uh, Timmermans in Stockholm only two weeks ago. So that work goes on in parallel. I don't see, the, I don't see that we have changed, that any country has changed uh, it's, it's, it's general approach to meeting the climate goals. I think we are strongly united there. Now, because of the, the war in Ukraine, because of the dependency, I see the efforts, and I thought the German government only yesterday, uh, 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 Chancellor Scholz, uh, now within very short, a uh, sh much shorter time, wants to, to, um, to lower its dependency and to become more independent and start looking at other energy sources, imports from other, other countries, and, and of course, looking at renewable sources, uh, speeding up that 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 process so if anything i would say uh, we are united in the ambitions and we are united now more than we were before in that we cannot make no european country should make itself dependent uh, on energy support from a country like russia at least with the with the regime that is now in in place uh, because we see what the effects have been and what the effects were not the least for with north stream 2 what the effects have been and were for ukraine but times were different when those decisions were taken. So I do not want to go back and say uh, Germany was, well, it was up to the Germans to draw those conclusions. The times were different, the expectations were different, and I think no German government uh, was ever, did ever consider that this could be one of the consequences. There were certain warnings, but I mean, what we're seeing now is so difficult to apprehend that in, the, you know, that in 2022, we have an open conventional war going on in Europe. 
So we're all learning our lessons and the optimism we perhaps had when dealing with Russia, I think that has, has left completely. And now we have Orient, we have to short, we have handle the short-term crisis, but not the least, we're jointly working together on meeting environmental goals um, um, in parallel. Regarding the personal records, is there one candidate more suitable than the other um, to deal with the crisis we faced and the one that we will face due to climate change? Um, listen, I don't think it is a Swedish diplomat, um, former ambassador to France, who should uh, put a judgment, this kind of judgment, onto candidates who right now I mean, are, you know, are, are uh, running for, for, for presidential elections in France. Uh, that, will have, that question is being put to the French voters and it should be answered by the French voters. I'm observing, I may have my personal views on it, but uh, I will in no way want to influence, uh, even at my humble level, uh, the decision of the French voters. It is up for them to make the judgment on, on and the conclusions they wish to draw on the voice they will, on the vote they will put on Sunday. Hi, my name is Jules Striffler. My question is the following. Do you, do you think that the outcome of the French elections uh, will uh, contribute in bringing into the spotlight uh, the discrepancy we can observe uh, between the treatment granted to refugees coming from Ukraine and, uh, the, and uh, the practices that can be observed throughout Europe toward other refugees? Thank you very much. Listen, refugees are refugees. I can understand the question uh, of Jules when he uh, puts it. Uh, I think the, sometimes you have to look for very human and easier answers than, than you would expect. I think I mean, I, we are a country who have you know, had very open refugee policy. We took amongst, I think we were probably in 2015, the country in Europe that took the highest numbers immigrants per capita. Um, uh, when the Syrian crisis hit us at hardest. And my then the then pro Swedish prime minister argued, we have to open your hearts, open your borders. But we very quickly realized that we were quite alone at that point, actually, when we don't talk about energy dependency to Russia. Germany was another of the countries, another European country who opened its borders largely and took close to Sweden, uh, I think the second position as you know, taking the highest number of refugees per capita in Europe. Thinking, of course, at that point, I was living in both, I was in Brussels and then in Paris, when these, when the crisis hit us, the refugee crisis hit us. And we were, we were quite disappointed not to see that that uh, solidarity was taken and that stand and openness and that solidarity was shared by all the EU countries. Of course, at that point, you also expected decisions are taken when you make certain scenarios and you hope that the crisis would be solved much quicker. It would be a temporary status. Syrians wanted to go back to their countries. But now we see that Syria, the problems, the deep problems in Syria have not been solved in between. And we are 2022 today. I think when you look at the, if you, if those that would argue that there are um, a difference in, in the treatment of refugees, I mean, we were probably more generous uh, in 2015 towards Syrians than um, now we have not had the same pressures on our borders because many Ukrainians are staying in Poland, many want to go back, some are already returning back at least to Kiev or eastern Ukraine. Um, I think the, the explanation, if you, do, if you consider that there are differences, probably due to the fact also that it's sometimes easier to recognize you know, a situation, difficulties, a refugees you know, suffering when, it's, uh, when they come from areas closer to where you live yourself, because you can more easily identify yourself with, with the, the issues, the problems, you know the country better, you know the, the situation in the country better. Uh, of course, Sweden has followed what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and the Eastern, we call it the Eastern Partnership neighborhood. The countries that have formed part are members of the Eastern Partnership. Uh, it's politics, it's, it, these are political situations uh, that most Swedes are more familiar with than they will be familiar with in, when we look at the Middle East. France, uh, living uh, being a southern European country, 
has a bigger, not better knowledge and understanding of what happens in Northern Africa. And you have French, normally for France and Southern European countries have taken in much more migrants from, you know, from, from, from crisis regions, but coming normally from the Southern border. And you'll be more familiar and have another acceptance because you've heard about, you know, their stories, their, their, their sufferings, the situation in their regions. So I think that probably plays, uh, you know, plays into the uh, perception and the acceptance uh, towards refugees. And that I think makes out the main difference um, also in the debate uh, when you now talk about the refugee status. But uh, I think the starting point is a refugee is a refugee independently where you come, where you come from. Uh, and what my prime minister probably would say is uh, now we took a very big part of the refugees in 2015. We're now in the process of integrating those that want to stay. Some have left already, some have gone to other countries, depending on where they find their happiness and where they feel most comfortable. Uh, and we still have are in the process where we want to see that they can be well integrated before you can open up new flows in order to being able to assure that the integration process works as well as possible. And I think the same kind of reflections we have in Sweden, disregarding the cultural or religious background of refugees coming, the same discussions of course go on in all countries uh, and, and each country will react differently depending on the country's own composition. What religion is predominant? What is the background of predominant? Is it more easily acceptable to integrate somebody closer to your own uh, cultural identity or somebody who's further away? So it's not so unique, uh, but the starting point, as I said, still has to be, if you are international refugee, uh, you have the rights and those rights have to be respected. And that goes disregarding the background you come from. So it's more giving explanations to the different behavior and approach to a refugee status, but the principle should be non-discriminatory, of course. Since the start of the Russian invasion, more than 4 million Ukrainians have had to flee their country. Once again, we have seen the importance of a common European approach to migration. So after the French presidential elections, how will France contribute to having a common EU asylum policy that respects international law and human rights principles? And that's a Finnish question to a Swedish diplomat on the French elections uh, and on the so presidential candidates' eventual positioning. Well, you see, I think those are again questions. It would be better to put those questions to a French um, to a, a French politician or or a French uh, representative. Um, I don't think uh, I, as Swedish diplomat, should make that judgment because I'll be or I'll be putting words into the mouth of. Uh, a, a future president Macron, I would assume that he would probably be, you know, he has been, France has been, I know, pushing for a common asylum policy. Actually, we now have a, a Swedish commissioner handling that sensitive and difficult dossier. But uh, I think those questions have to be answered by French representatives who can also put a personal view on it. And I do not want to make myself um, a, a spokesperson uh, or, or, or uh, you know, having uh, making a judgment on on what uh, different candidates. Uh, then you also know, as I do, as citizens you know, all citizens do when you come to elections, you take certain stands during the campaign, during the election campaign, and then the situation changes when you get into power because your responsibilities uh, are enlarged, and certain promises made will not be able to be kept the same way or they'll be redefined. So one has to be very careful to make too many judgments um, during a campaign. And right now, when it's only a few days we're talking about, I think right now we're sitting and watching. I watched the listen to the debate yesterday. That was interesting. That was cl quite clarifying as to certain stands on certain issues, not the least on this issue. But again, it's not for me to 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 you know to have any judgment on on two presidential candidates a few days before the elections.